Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Anthony McCauley, Director of the Philosophy Program at Western State Colorado University. Welcome to our final philosophy intersections of the academic year. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I'd like to first thank the English and Spanish programs for helping make tonight's intersections possible. I'd also like to thank Dr. Paul Edwards, there he is, the Chair of the Department of Communication, Arts, Languages, and Literature for his ongoing support, as well as Melissa Miser behind the camera, our Technical Director of Media and the students in Taylor Media and KWSB Radio for making our simulcast and YouTube presence possible. I'm also grateful to Western State Colorado University for their ongoing support of the philosophy program. And I'm pleased to announce that philosophy intersections will continue next year and our theme will be collaboration or the collaborative act. This semester, however, our theme in philosophy intersections has been progression. Tonight's presentation, Ductus in the Digital Age, looks at the progression of the physical act of writing across various media and is presented by our guest speaker, Dr. Allison Walker. Dr. Walker comes to us from Seattle University. She earned her PhD in English at UCLA, specializing in the history and future of the book. While at UCLA, she was an Andrew W. Mellon John E. Sawyer Graduate Fellow and awarded an internship in illuminated manuscripts by the American Trust for the British Library. Before teaching at Seattle University, she was a research fellow for the Department of Theological Studies and the Center for Digital Humanities out of St. Louis University. She's published several book chapters and articles, including The Boundless Book, A Conversation Between the Pre-Modern and the Post-Human, which recently appeared in Digital Humanities Quarterly. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Allison Walker. Thank you uh, to Western State and to uh, Dr. McCauley for having me tonight. Um, and yes, I'm going to talk to you guys about a concept called ductus, which I promise I will explain to you, um, and the digital age. So the ways that we read and write have never been static or singular. New innovations create moments of upheaval in the history of text technologies, and it is these disruptions that shape the future of reading and writing practices. I want to focus today on three very ordinary objects, the pen, the typewriter, and the stylus. And I want to ask a very simple question. Why are these particular tools amongst the most longest lasting of writing technologies? What can they tell us about a likely future trajectory for today's touchscreen? And I answer these questions by exploring the importance of ductus in each of these technological innovations. The first part of this talk defines ductus and will introduce you to the concept in medieval rhetoric and in handwriting. Next, I identify the ways that ductus changed after the invention of the typewriter. And then finally, I demonstrate the stylus's importance as a writing implement in the ancient world and in the first tablet computers. At the end of the talk, I ask all of us to look toward the future, to imagine the next writing technology by investigating the ductus in today's smartphones and tablets. In late antique and medieval rhetoric, it was understood that there was an abiding narrative threat that, although invisible, tied a piece of writing together. This concept is called ductus which comes from the Latin verb to carry or to lead. According to this philosophy, a reader travels through a text, moving from one thought to the next, led by the works ductus. This flow from one thought to the next in a composition probably seems like a familiar concept as you write papers for your courses or you teach writing. Some of the words we use to describe ductus today are thesis, narrative, plot, storyline, argument. This image, which is from Anne Carson's book, Knox, provides us with a physical example of ductus. Carson's work unfolds page by page, accordion style, as the reader explores the poem's narrative thread. As one reads each page, the accordion opens 
so that by the time the reader is finished, the narrative physically stretches across a room. The reader can look back and see how each page connects to the last, both in a narrative and physical sense. The almost impossibly long single sheet of paper is, quite literally, the work's ductus. Ductus is the way by which a work leads someone through itself, suggests Mary Carruthers, who studies medieval memory and rhetorical history, that quality in a work's formal patterns which engages an audience and then sets a viewer or auditor or performer in motion within its structures. Like Virgil, guiding Dante through the first stages of hell, the ductus of a work helps the wayward reader stay on the correct narrative path and represents the flow of ideas from the author to the reader. In medieval rhetoric, ductus is synonymous with metaphorical movement through a piece of writing. But there's a second definition of ductus that I wish to highlight here. Scholars of ancient writing or paleography and book history use the term to describe the general look of a type of writing or script and the appearance of a particular person's handwriting. A personal ductus determines the ways in which an individual scribe executed these traces and is a characteristic of his or her handwriting, claims paleographer Malcolm Parks. Changes in the personal ductus of different generations of scribes are an important factor in the general development of handwriting. This, of course, should be a familiar concept to us. We see these general, generational transformations in handwriting today. My grandmother's handwriting differs from my mother's and from my own. For that matter, my own handwriting differs if I'm writing a quick, quick grocery list, a note to a colleague, or however unlikely these days, a formal letter. In a more abstract sense, paleographical ductus can be defined as the formation of letters by an individual person or a generation of people and describes the precise movements of their hands as they write one letter form to the next. So in both medieval rhetoric and in paleography, the ductus is inherently tied to gesture and to forward momentum, whether in regards to handwriting or a work's argumentative flow. And as I take this discussion beyond the medieval period, I'd like to propose a third definition of ductus as a term that represents the movement and sensory experience inherent in the process of writing itself. That is, how we move our hands and bodies and feel our physical relationship to the surface upon which we are writing. Moreover, that sensory experience of writing is closely linked to the narrative threads that we create. Indeed, I argue that in order for a writing implement to be successful, the writer must experience both types of ductus. Thus, the physical act of writing is inexorably tied to the production of thoughts and ideas. I'm going to make a leap here and suggest that all of us recognize the sound of typing. Many of us start our mornings with this sound as we answer emails to students, colleagues, and as we get that bit of writing done before the house wakes up. For some of us, hearing that click of the keys is synonymous with work and industry, and at least for me, with the process of writing. The sound of typing is so ingrained into our lives as students, as scholars, as writers, that we take that we take the click, click, <coughs> click of the keys for granted. With the introduction of the typewriter, the ductus of writing changed from a process we associate with the movement of a pen across a page to one that is much more closely linked to the percussive click of fingers on keys. It is almost impossible to type on a keyboard without producing a sound, as many roommates can attest. <laughs> and while the movement of our hands is still an important component to the ductus of typing, it is the momentum of the sound that takes our thoughts forward when we type. On July 6, 1867, Scientific American ran a story on a surprising new 
technological advancement called the typewriting machine. The brief article I'm going to quote sums up this new technology in laudatory terms and claims that writing by hand will become obsolete because of the laborious and unsatisfactory performance of the pen. Legal copying and the writing and delivery of sermons and lectures, not to speak of letters and editorials, will undergo a revolution as remarkable as that affected in books by the invention of printing and the weary process of learning penmanship in schools will be reduced to the acquirement of the art of writing one's own signature and playing on the literary piano above mm. described, or rather, on its improved successors. This article presents the writing machine as a technological panacea for those weary of writing by hand. Most importantly for this discussion, the Scientific American makes one of the first references to the typewriter as a musical instrument, a literary piano highlighting the importance of the typewriter as a sound-making technology, as well as a writing machine. The typewriter, it seems, has been tied to sound from its inception. One of the first typing machines developed by Giuseppe Rabizza in 1855 was called the Cembalo Scrivano, or the Scribe Harpsichord. The Scribe Harpsichord had two rows of white and black keys, mimicking the layout of a harpsichord and explicitly linking the process of typing with music making. It is telling that Rabitza did not call his um, invention a piano, which smoothly moves from one note to the next. Instead, he chose the cembalo, or harpsichord, which plucks each note, resulting in a staccato sound, much like the sound of today's type, or typewriters and keyboards. This association with writing machines and sound isn't accidental. It marks a distinct change in the process of writing from one of almost silent forward momentum as the hand skims across the surface of a page to one of percussive explosions as one presses down on discrete keys. The first commercially successful writing machine was the Scholes Glidden Soule typewriter produced by the Remington Company in 1873. Yes, the same Remington Company. <laughs> the original model was built to resemble a miniature piano with its handsome black walnut piano style keys lettered in white in exactly the same positions as one would find on a keyboard. Now in 2009, artist Fabian Capello, together with Yamaha keyboards, created Typing the Sound, which combines a typewriter with a piano keyboard, making the implicit connections between typing and music making explicit. Capello took a standard typewriter, wired each key to play a different note. So as one types a sentence, the typewriter plays a melody. This project opens up a few interesting possibilities. What would Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist sound like as music? And on the other hand, what would Pachelbel's canon look like, reproduced as letters? <laughs> as Capello comments, the written language becomes an interface to musical performance. The forward ductus of musical notes mirrors the progression of typed characters, forming a multi-sensory path through musical and written conduit. The forward momentum inherent in handwriting that propels both thoughts and letter forms changes with the introduction of the typewriter to a staccato melody of the machine. Early users comment on the typewriter's ductus compared to writing by hand. This example comes from a fellow named Berghagen writing in 1898, and he says the pen has to undergo about five strokes in order to produce a letter. In the time it takes the pen to put a dot on the I or to make the U sign, the machine produces two complete letters. In this quotation, Berghagen specifically comments on the ductus of handwriting. The gesture that it takes to successfully write a single letter is drastically reduced from handwriting to typing. Instead of dotting I's and crossing T's, the writer strikes with one percussive movement by pressing down on the appropriate key. 
The ductus jet then changes from a person's movements as she writes letter forms across a page with a pen to the machine that performs most of the gestures associated with writing. In many early typewriters, indeed, when Berghagen was writing, the inner workings of the machine were laid bare to the user. And as the user pushed down a key, he could see the mechanisms moving to produce the typewritten letter. This particularly Lovecraftian example of a writing machine <laughs> is the Horton typewriter, produced around 1890. The Horton is an evocative example of how the machinations of the typewriter are on display for the typist to see as she types, and how the hammers of the machine begin to function as a mechanical prosthesis that replaces the ductus of writing by hand. One strike from the typist's fingers yields a quick series of mechanical movements that end in a letter form. The Horton is the first visible type typewriter. Before this point, the typist actually couldn't view the page as she typed. You couldn't see the letters as you were writing. You only saw it once the whole line was finished. Early typewriters then separated the relationship between the writer and the written word, and in doing so also separated the ductus between the thought process and the written execution of an idea. Contemporary writers like Heidegger notice this displacement between writer and writing, and in fact Heidegger comments that it is not accidental that modern man writes with the typewriter, and that the typewriter is an intermediate thing that veils the essence of writing and of the script. For Heidegger, the writing machine comes between the thinker and the thought in a way that writing by hand does not. Even though the typewriter is fundamentally a writing instrument, just like a pen is, Heidegger distrusts this machine because it takes away the ductus from the human hand and gives it over to the machine. To remove the hand from handwriting, undermines the process of writing itself. Nietzsche, on the other hand, did not share Heidegger's trepidations about writing with a typewriter. He remarks on the writing machine as an extension of the hand in his poem dedicated to his typewriter. <laughs> Nietzsche's writing machine was a Rasmus Malling Hansen's writing ball, or Schleidkugel. <laughs> it began commercial production throughout Europe in 1870. The writing ball was the first writing machine to surpass the speed of writing by hand. As Nietzsche wrote, Schleidkugel is ein Ding like mir, von Eisen. The writing ball is a thing like me, of iron. <laughs> and yet easy to twist, especially on journeys. Patience and tact one must richly possess. And fine little fingers, my favorite German, und feine Fingerchen. Fine little fingers to use us. Oh, Nietzsche. <laughs> he finds a strange affinity with his Schreibkugel. In stark contrast to Heidegger's disavowal of the writing machine, Nietzsche seems fascinated by this new writing technology. And instead of separating himself from the machine, like Heidegger does, Nietzsche finds aspects of himself mirrored back in the iron of the typewriter. Indeed, the distance between human and machine collapse. In the last line of Nietzsche's poem, as these fine little fingers type on the writing machine and on Nietzsche as well, suggesting that Ductus is still alive and well as one strikes the keys of a typewriter. Nietzsche's kinship with the Schreibkugel aside, the way we think about Ductus changes with the introduction of these writing machines. So much so that as the typewriter itself takes over the movement of writing, sound eclipses movement as one of the most important aspects of typing. And as we move from digits or from, di yeah, from digits to digital technology, I want to add one more postscript to my discussion of the typewriter and orality. Sound continues to be an important component to keyboards as they transition from typewriter to desktop computer. IBM's Model M keyboard and Northgate's OmniKey were originally produced in the late 1980s to mid-1990s and have attained quite a cult following because of the sound they produce. 
the bane of college roommates everywhere, these keyboards became known as clicky keyboards. <laughs> Due to the ubiquitous clicking noise of each keystroke, I love them, they're wonderful. They just have this amazing sound. Many diehard fans still use these keyboards, and there are whole websites that sell parts for these legacy keyboards, and the best part, there are YouTube videos. <laughs> filled with people showing off the clicking of their new Model M's. So, where is Ductus in the digital age? One might argue that our computer keyboards have simply carried on the aural ductus of the typewriter into the 21st century. But the touchscreen has introduced a new type of ductus as we swipe, click, and write with our finger, a virtual keyboard, or a stylus. Since its inception in the mid-1990s, the touchscreen has undergone a period of rapid technological upheaval that is incredibly similar to the developments we saw in the first typewriters. So for the last portion of my talk, I'm going to investigate the changes in ductus between PDAs and today's touchscreens. Oh, those are personal digital assistants for those who <laughs> did not know what they are. <laughs> Welcome to the digital <laughs> In 1996, I know, it takes us all back, U.S. Robotics introduced the Palm Pilot 1000, which quickly became the world's first successful personal digital assistant, or PDA. But the mid-90s fascination with PDAs can be traced back to Xerox PARC, and Mark Weiser's pioneering research in the emerging field of ubiquitous or pervasive computing. In an oft-quoted Scientific American article from 1991, over a hundred years since the same publication wrote about the future of the typewriter, Weiser defines uh, ubiquitous computing for future generations. The third wave in computing just now beginning First were mainframes, each shared by lots of people. Now we are in the personal computing era, person and machine staring uneasily at each other across the desktop. Next comes ubiquitous computing, or the age of calm technology, when technology recedes into the background of our lives. <laughs> Weiser describes a technology that is calm, that is fully integrated into our lives, so much so that the devices anticipate our needs. In many ways, Weiser's comments about the uneasiness of desktop computing are similar to Heidegger's apprehensions with the writing machine, when Heidegger calls the typewriter an intermediate thing. To both Heidegger and Weiser, technology needs to be unobtrusive to be successful. And the same can be said for a successful ductus. When we write with a pen or type with a keyboard, the technology we're using recedes into the background as our thoughts and our hands sink into the same motion. And it's not until our pen runs out of ink or our computer needs to be plugged in that we are forced to confront the technology with which we've been interacting. Weiser and his team at Park took the design principle of quiet and calm computing and created the first tablet computer called Tab, a Tab originally. Tabs were small, unobtrusive, and meant to travel with the user. They were one of the first digital mobile devices. Each came equipped with a small stylus instead of a keyboard. But technological limitations, especially those surrounding the ductus of these devices, made Weiser's dream of a quiet technology ultimately fall short, even though the researchers at Xerox PARC modeled their tablet after one of the most successful technologies to date. To find the most analogous technology to PARC's tablet and stylus, we need look no further than the wax tablet and metal stylus, the most popular writing technology from the Roman period through the late medieval era. These tablets were used for grocery lists, note-taking, drafts of longer texts, and for students as they learn to read and write. Wax tablets were convenient, mobile, and much cheaper to produce than any other pre-modern writing technology. The touchscreen of the pre-modern era was made up of a slab of wood that was then hollowed out and filled with a layer of beeswax to form the writing surface. 
The stylus was a hung piece of metal with a sharp end for writing and a flat, shovel-like tool on the opposite end, smoothing down the wax and erasing the inscribed text. Indeed, the wax tablets were so ubiquitous in the pre-modern era that Richard and Mary Rouse comment that the wax tablet had a longer, uninterrupted <coughs> association with literate Western civilization than either parchment or paper. The Rouses go so far as suggesting that there was a wax tablet subculture of technical terms regarding tablets and their use because of this popularity. Like today's touchscreens, wax tablets were lauded by late antique and medieval sources for their immediacy of use. In antiquity, wax tablets were called hugulares, or fist books, because of their small size, and they usually hung from the user's belt so that they were easily accessible at all times. Not that any of you guys ever wore anything <laughs> on your belt. <laughs> <laughs> One particularly effusive medieval writer, the abbot Baudry de Bourgay, penned a number of poems dedicated to his wax tablet, as one does. In one of these compositions, he writes, O oh, nova lex, nova res, O oh, the new standard, the new thing, the new race of tablets, I have in my hands more tablets. Poor guy goes on for another 20 lines. Explaining, it is a long poem. Explaining how amazing his new tablet is. The wax is a soothing green color that refreshes his eyes, which has weird counterpoints with the first monochromatic computer displays, if you think about it. The stylus easily slips into a wooden carrying case so he won't lose it. He has a custom-made velvet bag so he can carry his tablet wherever he goes. It seems that not much has changed since the late 11th century. <laughs> the ductus involved in writing on a wax tablet is very unique, um, and it's much different than writing on paper. In order to write on a wax tablet, the user must <clears throat> actively press onto the surface of the tablet and carve into the wax. This requires a very different ductus than writing on a piece of paper. Classical writers, many of whom used wax tablets for drafts of speeches and treatises, calmly applied the synonym excarare, or to plow up, instead of the word scribere, or to write, highlighting the furrows of wax that the writer creates as he uses a stylus, just as a farmer creates grooves in the soil when planting crops. Writing with a stylus and wax tablet was so different than with a pen and paper that a completely different ductus was needed in order to write quickly and effectively. And over time, a wax tablet script developed. This script survives in very few examples because of the liminal nature of wax as a writing medium. A tablet was meant as a quick and cost-effective device for composing drafts or making lists. Once a, po a person copied the composition to a piece of paper or bought their groceries, she could scrape the wax to flatten the lettered grooves or heat the wax and smooth the entire surface over. But a few instances of wax tablet scripts survive. And one of the best examples is Thomas Aquinas. His handwriting, of course, dubbed by <laughs> readers as Litera in intelligibilis, lettering that is barely intelligible. In fact, it's said that more than one of Aquinas' editors actually damaged their eyes trying to decipher his writing. So let's take a closer look at Aquinas' hand, not that it's going to help us, really. Uh, what is noticeable if you just look at the overall ductus of the script is that he has an incredibly idiosyncratic personal ductus. His script is highly abbreviated, and this is Latin, so it's highly abbreviated Latin shorthand, and it was really only meant for Aquinas himself. I've tried to recreate Aquinas' script so that we can actually look at the individual letter forms. Yes, this is what paleographers do on Friday nights. <laughs> yeah. Notice the straight lines, the right angles, and the quick pen strokes as well as the absence of any curves. 
All these signs point to a script that is typically written with a stylus instead of a pen. And we know this because when one inscribes in, with, in wax, it's very, very hard to do anything but an angle. So it's very difficult to make round letters. The constraints of the medium force the letter forms to have fewer curved lines. This makes the ductus of the script separated, quick, and perfect for carving on wax. Surprisingly, wax tablets were still in use as a mobile device through the 19th century. And with this longevity in mind, it comes as no surprise that the next generation of mobile computing playfully referenced its waxed counterparts by naming the, uh, the tablet, um, the tablet. And in regards to my 19th century um, comment, it was French fishermen. There was no good way for them to record their tallies every day on paper because paper would dissolve with the water. So the wax was actually the best technology they had to record their daily tallies for fishing. So they were still using it in some small French villages into the 19th century. The parallels between the wax tablet and the first generation of computers may seem glancing at first, but the similarities in ductus between writing instruments have wider implications as we think about the future of writing and mobility. Unlike today's tablets, Palm Pilots, Tabs, and the other first generation tablets used a resistive touch screen so that a user had to put pressure onto the screen with a stylus in order for a stroke to be registered. So it's very different than writing on our phones today. This is much like writing on a wax tablet. Weiser's team at Xerox Park also developed a simplified writing system called Unistrokes with, with a specialized ductus specifically for writing on a tablet with a resistive touch screen. Each letter in the Unistrokes alphabet was written as a single uninterrupted stroke so that the character recognition software would understand each stroke was a letter form. Not to be outdone, the Palm Pilot developed a similar alphabet to Unistrokes called Graffiti. And due to the Palm Pilot's uh, popularity, most of the first PDA owners used graffiti to write down appointments and to take notes. Both alphabets were ultimately based on a simplified form of the Roman alphabet so that users would more easily remember the new letter forms. Both graffiti and Unistrokes have much in common with Aquinas' script especially the simplified ductus of each letter and the constraints that we can see in each script due to the writing surface. There are, all, um, <clears throat> there are also some key differences to point out, mainly that the directionality of each stroke is of the utmost importance when writing in graffiti and unistrokes. If we look at the characters C and D in unistrokes, the only difference between the two and the only way for character recognition software to tell the two letters apart is that C begins at the bottom and move up, moves upwards, and D starts at the top and goes to the bottom. In Aquinas' script, our minds act as a predictive text technology. So even if we're not sure whether he wrote a C or an E, and let's face it, many times we're not, we parse the entire word and can make a judgment as to what the correct letter should be. Here, our minds act much like today's smartphones and fill in the appropriate letters where necessary. The ductus of Aquinas' writing may be difficult for us to read, but using a wax tablet must have been second nature to him, since his script, even when written on paper, shows the influence of wax. But to take us back to Weiser's goal of quiet computing, if Aquinas is able to compose text on a wax tablet so fluently, and is able to blend rhetorical ductus with paleographical ductus so seamlessly, the technology of the wax tablet definitely receded into the background. But the same cannot be said for the ductus of the first PDAs. Learning a new writing system like Unistrokes, even if it is a simplified version of the Roman alphabet, is not as easy in practice as it seems, especially for writing anything longer than a grocery list or calendar entry. Size was also a limiting factor to the first PDAs, um, and not as much for the, the wax tablet. Wax tablets came in many sizes, but usually they were about the size of today's Kindle. 
or next to seven. Typically, you could open them like a book, and there were two wax surfaces on which to write. Some users had wax tablet books that had six or eight individual tablets bound together so that they could compose longer texts. The screens of most PDAs, however, were much too small for a person to write more than a few letters across. Instead, a user wrote each word on top of the last, creating an interesting ductus to be sure, but not one conducive to doing more than jotting quick notes. Indeed, Palm Pilot's name for its alphabet, graffiti, suggests this quick, scribbled writing instead of carefully written reflections. Unlike wax tablets, PDAs did not give their users a means of producing sustained and nuanced thoughts. Their ductus impeded the writing and thinking processes alike, which is one of the reasons, from a usability standpoint anyway, that the ductus of today's touchscreens is vastly different than from Palm Pilots and Tabs. A <coughs> Sorry, the smartphone uh, phones and tablets we use today have capacitive touch displays, which allow the use of a finger as a stylus. And instead of unistrokes and graffiti, most of these devices come equipped with a virtual keyboard. As mobile technology becomes more ubiquitous in our lives, they are fast replacing laptops and desktop computers as we use um, them for all different types of writing. Where, then, is the ductus in today's smartphones and tablets? Is it to be found with the virtual keyboards that are offered with most mobile operating systems? Even though the keyboards on our mobile devices are mere ghosts of their physical cousins, I would wager that most of us still use them. I know I do. From a design perspective, having a tiny keyboard that one navigates with thumbs and index fingers is cumbersome at best, as the misspelled Latin on the screen can attest. The move to virtual keyboards has taken away the physical response that we expect when we write, except for the odd device that has haptic feedback, which mimics the vibrations of a physical keyboard. But these devices ultimately fall short because while they mimic a physical keyboard, the ductus is missing. A virtual keyboard is a skeuomorph, a design feature that is no longer functional in itself. According to literary theorist Kate Hales, a skeuomorph acts as a threshold device, smoothing the transition between one conceptual constellation and another. It calls to play a psychodynamic that finds the new more acceptable when it recalls the old. And it is in the process, uh, sorry, excuse me, when it recalls the old, that it is in the process of displacing. Having a virtual keyboard as a writing instrument is comforting to us. It's a reference to a technology with which we're very familiar. And it eases the transition from our desktop and laptop computers to our new devices without innovating, changing, or improving the ways we interact with these machines. In a recent Wired article, Clive Thompson claims that skeuomorphs are hobbling innovation by lashing designers to metaphors of the past. Unless we start weaning ourselves off them, we'll fail to produce digital tools that harness what computers do best. Can we imagine a smartphone without a virtual keyboard? And if we go beyond the keyboard, what might ductus look like? How will we interact with this new device? Thompson's assertion that skeuomorphs, like virtual keyboards, are slowing down innovation may very well be true, but importantly for this discussion at least, using skeuomorphs as input devices changes the ductus so much that it becomes untenable. Using a virtual keyboard in novel and unexpected ways, however, can yield exciting innovations. Swipe and other analogous applications use a virtual keyboard for input, but instead of the user hunting and pecking for letters with a thumb or finger, one traces the path between letters on a virtual keyboard in order to read a word. 
Only then does the user lift up the finger between words. So for those of you who haven't used swipe, the image in this word is quick. And it's spelled out using swipe. The user starts by touching Q and then without lifting up her finger quickly moves into the next place for each letter. As her tr finger travels a blue line that I've been calling a word path because there's no better term for it, I guess. I, the, the people who, I, I've been reading white papers about swipe and couldn't find them called anything. So I thus now call it a word path. Um, <laughs> illustrates the route that this finger has taken. So here's another example of a word path using swipe. This time spelling the word world. Although swipe use, uh, uses a virtual keyboard, the user's <coughs> ductus when writing with swipe is drastically different than while typing. In a spatial sense, the letters that form a word cease to matter as much as the pattern of the word path itself. The word path or blue line fades quickly between words, but each spelled out word has its own unique shape. I've been using swipe for the past three years, and I already find myself putting flourishes on my words as I type them, giving my swiping its own unique ductus. And after watching videos of others using swipe, yes, of course, there are YouTube videos on this, <laughs> I've noticed that users begin to have their own ductus while using swipe. Even though there's a prescribed path for each letter based on the word spelling, people seem to be creating a ductus as they swipe. Swipe's user experience is strikingly similar to pale paleographer Albert Derolet's definition of a cursive script. As a script, intended for rapid and fluent writing, which therefore involves a simplified ductus and a reduction of the number of pen limbs. Mm -hmm. Today we think of cursive as a stilted, old-fashioned script that we use for writing checks and signing tax forms and occasionally posting salon articles about the death of cursive on Facebook. <laughs> um, but in fact, cursive developed over time so that people were able to write more quickly since there were fewer pen lips. Cursive was the less formal script. It was used for quick correspondences and business. Swipe functions in much the same way on our mobile devices, especially since many, <clears throat> excuse me, many people have reported typing up to 50 words per minute using swipe. Swipe takes the medium of a keyboard and combines it with the gestures found in handwritten script, seamlessly creating a new method of communication to create a means of ductus-based com um, communication using a touch screen. Swipe is really only the beginning to exploring ductus in the digital era. Indeed, I agree with UI designer and blogger Brett Victor when he argues that when we interact with our tablets using only one finger, we sacrifice all the tactile richness of working with our hands. We deny our hands what they do best, grabbing, maneuvering, touching. This movement, this ductus, is of paramount importance as we consider how the forward momentum of our thoughts is guided by our other sentences, or senses as we write and as we interact with our devices. Before I finish, I want to revisit the two types of ductus that I defined at the beginning of this talk. Each of the writing technologies I've highlighted today, the pen, the keyboard, and the stylus, and I'm specifically referring to the stylus of the wax tablet here, facilitate the movement of our thoughts into a narrative thread. It's not a mistake that most of us don't write papers on our smartphones. And when we do use our tablets to write long compositions, we attach a physical keyboard to do so. Writing by hand, by keyboard, and by stylus encourages the type of sustained thought that medieval rhetoricians were studying when they first coined the term ductus. And by analyzing how ductus is inherent in history's most durable writing technologies, we can observe its evolution and fully consider how gesture, movement, and the future of writing go hand in hand. Thank you. Like the fact that other people can read it, does that affect the thickness of, of the writing? 
that makes sense? I don't know. Like, are you asking me, would your writing change if you were, say, writing a letter to a friend on a keyboard versus writing a paper for Professor Macaulay on the keyboard? Is that what you're asking, or? I, I was just wondering if, like, the fact that, like, like something being like public, like on the internet or whatever, if that affects, I, I mean, I imagine it would affect the way you write it because you're trying to be more professional, but I didn't know if it would affect like the writing itself, if that makes sense. I'm not sure it would affect the writing itself, but as a person who has to write on a whiteboard in public a lot, I would say that having, you know, to do that physical act of writing in front of people definitely changes my ductus. It's much more halting because I have to make sure I'm making no spelling mistakes. <laughs> and I have to and I have to make sure everything, you know, is not in my quick scribble. It's spelled out for students. So in that case I would say yes. But when you're typing, I haven't noticed that. Again, it's a very personal thing that I'm talking about, right? This process of writing and the technologies that we use. So my yes or no may maybe somebody else's um, different answer. But for me, yes, when I'm writing physically, but not so much when I'm writing on a keyboard. Any other questions? Yeah. Has there been any research on, on uh, kinesthetic memory and what it is that you use? In other words, I, this, is, this is a discussion that I've had with a colleague for a couple of years. That, mm -hmm. That writing, that certain certain of us, by writing by hand, we actually remember something better than we might if we type on a keyboard? Yeah, scientists, and neuroscientists especially, and psychologists are actually now doing a lot of really good research about this. And much to students' dismay, writing by hand gives you a better memory recall on tests. Students who take notes by hand consistently do better on tests than those that write on the keyboard, and people think it's because when you're on your keyboard, you're, you can type so quickly that you just copy what the person says. When you write by hand, you actually have to parse it, because there's no way you write, you can write every single thing that the professor says. So yeah, there is actually a different type of process that you use when you're writing versus typing notes. So a lot of people from the social and hard sciences are starting to do the same type of work. Um, and talk, I guess talk, really talk about ductus. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So as a follow-up, I mean, swipe is great for what I might call disposable communication, like a grocery list yeah. or a short-term thing that you have to remember. But if you're going to do whole-on research where you're trying to incorporate a body of knowledge, you would... It's not great. It's not I, I mean, I've tried to write whole emails, and I get annoyed and then go back to, um, to my keyboard. Mm -hmm. I have been challenged, though, to say that it's generational, oh, that sure. maybe the next mm -hmm. generation of students are going to be so used to typing on smartphones that they're not going to have that you know hesitation but the research still pans out with students not um, handwriting and doing better on tests mm -hmm. so I'm not sure if the the generational comment works mm -hmm. but yeah you're right swipe is great it's better than a virtual keyboard mm -hmm. but it's not the answer there is right now there is really no answer to what we should do next to what comes after this this oops Seems to be, um, seems to be, the only thing we have right now. Right. Yeah. What first interested you about this topic? Um, well, I'm a paleographer. I study old handwriting, so my specialty is looking at medieval manuscripts and reading them. And I just started thinking about how when people were writing how, and especially for me when I'm typing, I get in this space and I hear the keys and like, it's this wonderful moment where the technology really recedes. And so I just wondered, and I don't have that with my smartphone. And so I wondered like, okay, well, how is it that typewriters took over that process? How is it, and then what comes next? Because I, I guess I, because I'm a, a medievalist and kind of a digital person, I, I say I, I, I have a Janus face, like I'm always looking in both directions. <laughs> and so it's, it's, I always want to look to see what's next, but for me it's always informed by, by the past stuff, which is why I talk about wax tablets and tablets. I just like technology. Like all, and I, I view the book and like paper as a technology just like you know your phone is. So I don't know, in my head it all made sense. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. So I don't know if this is specifically connected to this thing we call ductus, but um, 
I was struck by one of the quotations you had up there was sure. that um, the technology we use these days, like uh, smartphones and that kind of thing, has what is a calm technology that's sort of received. Oh, Mark Weiser, yeah. I've, I've walked into classrooms where no one is speaking to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's and quiet, it's right? not they're <laughs> staring at the walls, they're staring at their PDA, they're yeah. staring at their cell phones. Um, if that's not front and center, I don't know what is. And so I was just wondering, like, what, how do we, how can we conceptualize uh, this so-called calm t technology that's as something that recedes in the background? It hasn't happened. I, I, I think Mark Weiser was talking about um, his hope for ubiquitous computing. And so far, my answer would be that it hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. That, if anything, devices have become even more front and center. And I think um, that technologists now, um, people call it the, the Internet of Things, and like how having something like the Nest that's going to anticipate that you want your house warm when you come home from work, but cool during the day because you're not there, lights coming on before you enter the room, your music always playing to the right thing, all that is more calm technology than the smartphone. Calm only insofar as it does what we want it to do. <laughs> yeah. In a sort of docile kind of way. Sure. Um, with this, with this, the cell phones especially, um, I just wonder if, if it would make any sense, and I don't know if it would, but just to put it to you, would it make any sense to think of um, storytelling and even ordinary day conversations that we have, like on our cell phones, uh, as having being able to be like a characterized by this thing you call that? I think so. And I actually think that we are, and this is like the postscript that I haven't written yet, I wonder if what is happening right now is that we are returning to oral culture, which is, you know, something that folklorists and things mm -hmm. talk about. You know, Beowulf was written down, but it was probably, you know, uh, passed along orally. And I wonder if because we don't have a replacement for our writing devices, if we are in fact returning to a time period where speaking is actually, and you do have a dictus when you speak. If anyone's ever been to a poetry slam session, you hear that amazing rhythm that, that you have when you're speaking. And even when I'm speaking, like you get into this zone when you're speaking, and it's very much like that. I don't, I mean, I must look crazy when I'm in a car, especially when I'm on my way to an interview. I am like, I'm animated, and it's just me in the car, and I'm talking, and I'm giving the best answer. <laughs> and you really, at that point, do have this dictus, right? That you have these thoughts that are coming, and they're, they're, they're being produced in such a way, and I always am like, I wish I could write that down, I wish I could record that. So I wonder if we're returning to an oral culture. And just in the context of the household with the what I would presume is the reduction, mass reduction of landlines. Sure. In other words, cell phones that are shared, that are answerable by anybody in the household. I mean, I have my cell phone and it would be, it's inconceivable to me that anyone would answer my cell phone <laughs> when it rings. That's and I think true. That, I mean, you know, so just kind of sociologically, it seems that cell phones contribute to, what I might think, the, the hyper-individualization yeah. of the communication in that, in that way. Maybe just the, no, the, the landline and the, Cell phone analogies. Well, going back to like party lines of the 1960s, <laughs> where like originally like the phone was a completely social thing, mm -hmm. and then it totally got. And now you're right. You're seeing kind of the end of that, where I feel guilty when I answer my husband's cell phone, even though like if it, it they function as our home phones. But you're right. They're totally hyper individualized. That's a great comment. Yeah. Party lines. <laughs> Who wants to describe a party line? I'm happy to say that party lines occurred before I came about. So I heard about them from my mom. Uh, but I could be wrong. You shared a one single phone line between multiple people. So you can pick up the phone and actually overhear somebody else's conversation. I would reference the amazing movie Pillow Talk by Doris, or with Doris Day and Rock Hudson mm -hmm. that involves some hilarity with a shared line. So yeah, people could all use it because it was one phone line. And I don't know, did people get certain times? Well, you checked your own phone numbers, but they were lumped together, you know, onto a single one. I'm telling you guys, the history of technology is <laughs> yeah, there's, so it was it was a party line in that. It was a 
party. There are more people. <laughs> <laughs> you can more ostensibly <laughs> overhear other people's conversations. Yeah. Who was the, I, I, I missed this part, I wanted to ask you a question on it. Uh, sure. That was uh, arguing against skill morphs and said that, you know, if th that it was interfering with the ability of the computer, for computers to do what computers do best. And what is it that, that the author thought computers did best? Yeah, I thought that was interesting too. I think that he's referencing you're going to produce digital tools that are completely innovative, that are like, I, truly breakthroughs in technology. You're constantly going to be tied. So I think that he's referencing like the fact that new computers came about and there was a, the technologists like to talk about computer technology as if there were no other technologies before that. Right. But I mean, basically the same type of laudatory terms that um, the guy, that the Scientific American guy was talking about in the type, yeah. Yeah. The type of machine, yeah. So I assume that that's what, I think that that's what he's okay. talking about here. Yep. All right. There was just an article somebody posted on Facebook that I marked to read later about skewomorphs ruining something, so I need to buy out. Forward it to me, please. I can forward it to you. Yes. Any, um, have you looked at, or is there any research on, like, we use Dragon Naturally Speaking, so voice to text software. Mm -hmm. So any thoughts on that in terms of doctors? I think that goes back to kind of this return to oral oh. culture mm -hmm. and using the voice as a replacement for the, the um, keyboard. So I haven't thought about it in any kind of academic way other than what I've already said. So do you use it? Do you find yourself speaking very fluently? You know, I don't use it very often. Um, we have it you know, available for students to use. But it is interesting. I've been able to have three different versions of it now. And it's gone from very clunky to okay. this newest version. It's really seamless. Like you can just talk and it writes for you. But I've never written a paper with it. So it would just be I haven't either yeah. because my Ductus is in, like for me that typing and the handwriting. Yep. I sir, I would prefer it. I think no, that would I know. Be really challenging. It would be. I, I would actually. It would be interesting. I could write the the oral section of my. There you go. <laughs> that would be quite the thought experience. Any other questions? Yeah. Real quick, uh, in my field in social science, uh, we study a lot of uh, uh, phenomena that spread through social networks. Mm -hmm. Like happiness and divorce and uh, sure. um, attitudes. I wonder if, if this thing called ductus is something. It sounds like it's a huh. a style of presentation, kind of the th a theme, a thread that guides the listener, that guides participants in an interaction. I wonder if, uh, in terms of orality and how we build our words, if that if that is something. I don't know if, if sociolinguists or if, if folks have studied whether. Um, styles of speaking, ways of, of kind of connecting a theme or a thread can actually spread through a network, can be sort of contagious. Oh, people have been, I, I think that the most famous example in the news right now is the vocal fry example that young women supposedly do when they, I don't, I can't like, is that like they uh, like, it's like, can someone do it? No, no, I'm no, it's kind of <laughs> like a lot of the 20s yes, are yes, yes, yeah. Yes. yeah, okay. So that's a good, that, thank you. That's a good example of the word. But um, that being something that is um, associated with young women. And so I know a lot of linguists are doing a lot of studies on, and there have been quite a few popular articles about um, the kind of wildfire spread of this phenomenon of vocal fry, although as a Southern Californian in the 80s, I would say that it's been around a lot longer. Well, I, should say, yeah. I actually grew up in Southern California, and like yeah. totally, I mean, whatever. <laughs> 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 it not strike me as like a, an example. Okay. I mean, it, it sounds like, you know, a, a, a And maybe I'm misunderstanding your question. Oh, no, I, and I don't, I don't mean that you miss oh, no, no, um, that That uh, a person's ability to like sustain a line of thinking or to communicate some kind of theme, like in telling a story or saying that you did something yesterday um, in a particular way without sounding a certain way, but just using certain kinds of combinations of words. I get the, like the vocal fry kind of thing and the maybe valley girl kind of talk, they're all, you know, different kinds of accents. So now maybe the accents, type I guess, of speech codes would 
register me. Yeah. So I'm switching my feed example. Can I ask for some clarification that might help with that question? Sure. Um, I'm not sure I understand the word ductus. Okay. Um, because you said it's to lead. So does ductus refer to the process that the writer is going through or the process that the reader is going through? Sure. Okay. So um, the original definition of ductus was used, um, was coined in um, in Roman times. Uh, it was coined a very long time ago, to, and it was talked about this path that the reader takes through a text. So it was tied to a reader. Right, but the way that you're talking about it is almost like it's yeah. the path that we're yeah, we're, so, we're, so, so we're journeying through our writing style, whether it be through so that's that's the first the first definition of ductus. Paleographers then took that and talked about ductus as a type of script. Like I can see that the ductus of a lot of young women's script right now is very bubbly, for example. What I'm saying is let's take those two things together. And I'm proposing a definition of ductus that is tied to writing that's saying that there is something about writing technologies when they're successful, it is because when we write with whatever technology it is, we actually attain that kind of pathway. We can write fluently, I guess. We attain the pathway? Or, I'm yes. sorry, I missed what there. So, um, mm -hmm. That we, we are- no, I think I'm following you. It's like it helps give you momentum. In a sense. Yeah, that you get this momentum that enables right. you to write fluently. Yes. And so that's like my, uh, it was a definition that I'm coining, not something that has been, so the original definition of ductus is that the, the one I described at the beginning, um, where it's a reader, but I'm taking it to mean that it's a writer actually being able to have that fluency. Yes. Like, how does it compare like with I guess it's kind of, I mean, have you guys ever been in a space where the writing actually just flows and you're writing an amazing piece of whatever it is, whether it's a song, a poem, a prose? I mean, yeah, not lately. But okay, so let's talk about the absence of it. We all know when there's an absence of it, right? When you write two words and you delete them and you write another word and you cross it out. So yeah, ductus is that kind of that where writing is actually feeling really good and now I forgot your question. I, I was just wondering how it compared to rhythm. It, I mean, it is when you are in like the, the rhythm, rhythm of metaphorically. Life. And I think that you have to have that rhythm, whether it's metaphorical, whether you're hearing it with the keys, or whether it is when you're actually writing by hand where you have that rhythm in your hand. So I think it's very much tied to that rhythm. And when ductus doesn't work, when you can't write long form things, like when you have your phone, it's because your thoughts go too fast and your phones can't quite catch up with your thoughts. So when you don't have rhythm. So yeah, I would say it's very much tied to rhythm. But another question. Yeah, is it, is it in like all forms of communication? Like is there ductus in like hand, hand language and like that kind of stuff? That is not my field of <laughs> I mean, I would, I would say probably for people who are incredibly good at something. It's also, it, think about it, learning a new language, the night you dream in a new language where you're like, aha, you have the moment. So I would assume it might be, but I, that's an assumption. Yes. Something you said about bubbly handwriting, mm -hmm. most typically utilized by women. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong in interpreting? I just want to make sure I had that right. Oh, I would say, and, and this is me speaking uh, at only in, and looking at my own handwriting and the handwriting of my students as well, I would say there is a ductus. Is ductus mm -hmm. gendered? I don't know. Like I'm, I'm just going to take a wild chance here, I, okay, and reveal a bias that I've had and this is an instructor reading written work mm -hmm. that, and it's, it's a bias, it's a gender bias that I have, that it's I'll see bubbly hand, bubbly <laughs> what's that? Oh, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> I have bubbly handwriting written by a woman and sharp yeah. angular handwriting written by a woman. I don't like I'm going to take the sharp angular handwriting written by a woman. I'm going to have that personality. I'm going to perceive that person, at least on the surface, as being smarter wow. than the one that has the bubbly handwriting. Burn. Well, I'm going to admit that because it's, I might as well be honest about it. No, but that's actually, that yeah, opens up something that's really interesting, which is handwriting so and gender, which is not something I've thought about. You have had your hand up, and I apologize for, for ignoring you. That's fine. Um, 
I have a, a question for you regarding lighting. Sure. And I'm a little concerned about what happens with the writing, uh, the, the thinking, the writing process when you use tablets. Because uh, I don't know if the, there must be regularity uh, about it, but there's this pressure that the machine puts on you. So is your thinking process, uh, because you are doing it through this instrument, uh, affected? Oh, interesting. Well, I guess I would go back to, to me talking about um, the note taking um, and the different note taking strategies that students were using. People who wrote received higher grades on tests than people who typed. So I would then say, yeah, you're, the technology you're in, that you're using is influencing the way you're parsing information. Tablets, though, I think the reason why we don't use tablets is because there is no good way to, I mean, do you, do you students use your tablets with virtual keyboards mm -hmm. yeah. to write, to take notes, and you're cool with it, it's great, like it doesn't. No, it's not great, I don't like it at all. <laughs> <laughs> but we do it. <laughs> yeah. Can I offer a different perspective? It's just like, there's something about touching the screens too that is a lot quicker. I've been a server for a lot of years, and we always do, and it's not the same as writing, you're not composing anything, oh, but no, you're communicating you yeah. in a very quick way, and we move through that very fast. So for me, to have a touch screen feels natural, but it's natural for a particular set of goals that I'm trying to accomplish. Sure. I couldn't imagine writing out a, a table's order <coughs> on a piece of paper. Um, it would take me too long. I wouldn't be able to memorize my table's orders, but I can memorize them because I can go to a screen and type them up really sure. fast. Um, but and here's my question for you. Um, I'm not clear as to whether you think that typewriting or stylists or PD or are, are typing on, on Palm Pilots or whatever um, is a replacement to handwriting. How do you see the relationship between, uh, since this is about progression, Sure. how do you see the relationship between our handwriting and our typing? Do you see it as a net, as, because I'll, I handwrite particular thoughts and I type particular thoughts. Mm -hmm. I type things that I intend other people to read, which is why I'm curious as to why your students are still handing in handwritten things. Well, if you're doing in class. Well, you do in class stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense, I guess. But when I when I handwrite, <laughs> <laughs> when I handwrite, that's for me, and that's what my mother taught me to do. Sure. You journal every day, and that's where those are your thoughts for okay. you, and they're not for anybody else. But if I write on a legal pad, it means that I'm organizing. Yeah. There's a particular medium that you use for the object. So I'm curious as to, as to whether you see a progression. I see a progression in the technologies, but I do not think that one technology is better for writing than another. The only time that I am, am making a value judgment would be the first Palm Pilots, which really kind of didn't work very well. They're forcing you to use this kind of new alphabet, and they did that because of the technology, because you had to press down. So I, I don't think that a keyboard is better at writing than a pen. I mean, a lot of people will, but that's, I mean, that's, that's, it's, I think it's a very personal choice. Like you said, you use one thing for one thing and another. I do my pre-writing by hand, then I move to my computer. So, I mean, I think it's very, very different for different people. But I think it brings up a paradox because flow with technology comes easier, mm -hmm. especially if you're writing a different language where you have word completion programs and you start a word oh, and it gives you complete there words that you possibly might not use in that foreign language mm -hmm. because it's not part of your day-to-day -day vocabulary. Sure. So suddenly you find a style that flows pretty easily because of that technology, but it's not really authentic to you as a person because if you had to write it in handwriting, that would not be your style. So that, that is a little bit of a paradox that I see because yes, there's a flow, but it is really removed from, from you as a person because you wouldn't express yourself like that and in I, handwriting. I would say that occurs actually in people's first language. I am teaching 
a lot of writing courses right now, and the amount of thesaurus words I get on a regular basis. So I mean, these are mostly people who are, are English as their first language, but it sounds as if they don't speak English well because they're not using, they're using words that technology gives them and not using their own voice. So yeah, I think you're right that there is a paradox, which is why in-class writing is so powerful, because then you're, it's a forcing function. Yes, you had your hand up. I didn't mean to forget you. you did. Um, thank you for your presentation first. And um, I have a couple students here that know that flow is a red flag word in my class. <laughs> and part of that is because I'm coming from the poetry side of the equation. So thank you for Nietzsche and the Abbot. Um, but I'm, there's this you know, folklore and modernist poetry that is a result of a brand new typewriter, William Carlos Williams said, that we can break the line in different places because it looks as beautiful as end stop lines used to look. And I think with lyric poetry, like the idea of the narrative thread is really different. Mm -hmm. So that those jumps and spaces between the way that you connect the ideas mm -hmm. is not necessarily tied to flow, if that makes sense. Sure. And I wonder if, as you're encountering these new technologies, if you're seeing any new kinds of approaches to the way that we create not just narrative art but written arts if that makes sense can you uh, tell me what your distinction is that you're making between written art and narrative art so that um, lyric poetry and narrative poetry aren't necessarily the same things that not all poetry has a narrative thread that you're supposed to follow from the beginning sure. to the end sure and i'm wondering if technologies are allowing for those kind of um, removed from narrative conversations in writing in general. So that obviously if you're writing a paper to get a point across, you're gonna start at the beginning and finish at the end. Yeah. But it seems to me that some of these technologies and the ductus that we're using and the autofill words um, are counter to flow. And I wonder if anything good is happening. From yes. This. And other kinds of writing are surfacing other than narrative. I would say that, that that type of of experimentation with technology and writing is happening more on the electronic literature side of things. And so there are a lot of really amazing um, writers that are working in that field. There's one, no, but it really does have a narrative. Sorry, I'm like going back and trying to find a good example for you to, to go back and look at, but I can't come up with one right off the top of my head. But yes, that they're experimenting with the technology in a way, although I haven't seen anybody experimenting with anything like Swipe or any virtual keyboard technology. I'm looking at that. But there may be things. I'm sorry I didn't have a good answer to your question. Yes? Um, I recently found out about this artist who is um, doing Japanese calligraphy, um, but on gra like a grand scale. So mm -hmm. he'll, he'll use a bowl floor, and instead of like a sumi brush, he's got this very yeah, yeah. heavy um, thing. Oh, so he actually, like, like the brush is giant. Yeah, yeah, and it oh. takes all this torque, and then he's wonderful. probably to, to move around to, to make character. Sure. So, um, but I was wondering like, with the idea of that type of calligraphy, where it's to make a character in a particular way, mm -hmm. and, and, and the beauty of the character itself sure. um, is the goal. Does that fall within the idea, or this possible definition of ductus that is yoked to art, or is, is that representation itself falling into the idea of ductus? And I guess, I mean, I think when it, you know, the, the oh. idea of like literally of manuscripts, I love them. Um, and, that, and, and that, of course, is what I what I immediately started thinking of. Right, but then they they, they go to reproduce the document, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering, like, if the idea of the individual character as like is, a unit of does if if Ductus has like a unit or I, yeah yes <laughs> God, I don't know I never thought <laughs> <laughs> um, no and I I I'm the type of person who will actually honestly say that um I. I would say that for me at least, as a person who's done calligraphy and who loves the art of handwriting, 
that my ductus and making beautiful letters is tied to my thoughts. So especially, and I'm a note taker too, and a doodler. So like when I take notes in class, like I come, like I draw and I make these connections. And so I would say maybe that goes back to your colleague's comment about like non-linear, like non-linear thoughts and ductus. Is this beauty of note taking that happens? where things aren't connected and then you connect them through different things and create some kind of a path through them that way. Although I guess for me it always ends in a path and, and, and she was saying there is no path in some of these. But yeah, I would say it does and I would say that people are experimenting that online with creating amazing infographics. And there are a couple artists actually that I'm never going to remember. Why do I do this? Um, I never <laughs> remember them, but like had a, it's a writing professor who is also a graphic designer, and she t teaches her class and has like her syllabus is actually this amazing written unit with all these arrows and it flows and it's amazing, and so it has this both physical beauty and kind of narrative ductus. How that makes sense in my larger argument, I have no idea. <laughs> but I do think that there is something with creating that text and the letter forms, because I'm a paleographer, I study letters. So yeah, I mean, and I think that the medieval, the medieval scribes, like if you look at 15th century Italian humanist script, there is this joy that comes through in making these beautiful letters. So yeah, I mean, and there's actually a couple really interesting people whose names I, of course, have forgotten, um, that are doing things with like, whether script and letters can carry emotion um, in, in, in medieval writing, things mm -hmm. like that. So. Yes? I think would it be fair to say that also handwriting is not equal to handwriting when it comes to the doctors because when I use a fountain pen mm -hmm. or I use a pencil or a regular pen, I think there would be probably also differences in sure. the way that mm -hmm. So, I mean, handwriting is not equal. I mean, no, I have, no, I, I no, handwriting some, is not equal. That, I think that's what you're talking about, too, is the way that people do the letters might also the medium that they use to write with. Sure, I mean, there was a script change because of the angle of the, um, the, um, the pen that they were using. They cut it a different way, and it actually helped a script to develop. So, I mean, yes, the script, it, can change based on your writing implement. Everyone has gotten a horrible pen where you have to sign your name and you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but like, or like you take notes on a pen that's not yours. I have a specific type of pen I like to use. I have a specific mm -hmm. pencil and they stopped carrying it so I had to go like be the weirdo who bought like this one mechanic pencil in bulk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, all of that. Different writing, all writing is not, and then you have like I don't want to say pretentious, but people who like use the fountain pens on a regular basis and whip it out in class, then mm -hmm. ink all over everybody. Yeah. <laughs> like, but that is also like a type of ductus as well, like the writing of the fountain pen. You do that, don't you? No, I don't. No, I don't. No, no, no. <laughs> just a pointer, not the fountain pen. I didn't want to interrupt. Though. No, okay. no. When talking about the handwriting aspect and the fountain pen, is that I have definitely, I wanted to talk to you about this afterwards or sure. tomorrow, is that I experimented with taking notes on my PDA with a oh, stylus. And, and it's it's specific to the like the galaxy line because it's not it's not capacitive, it's actually its own kind of has a point to it. Oh. And what I found is that the there I started to think that it was around the idea of resistance because there is no resistance when you write. It's very accurate. It gets pen strokes to a very fine degree. Mm -hmm. And I can actually, my handwriting is very similar on this when it's, for, but it's too, I can write too fast on it because when I'm oh. writing with a pen, so that's when I need a fountain pen I will actually use when I'm writing the really detailed kind of work that needs really long That thought. makes you slow down. Well, it's yeah. the pretty keyboard, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're going too fast, so right. we have to invent a way to make you slow mm -hmm. down. Thus, QWERTY was born. So this, writing with a, a, a stylus like this on, on here, or on a larger um, note that I have, mm -hmm. it's, 
it's something that was interesting, but it, it, there's, there is a lack of that kind of resistance. And I'm, I'm trying to experiment with different covers, mm -hmm. you know, different screen protectors to see oh, if so one gives you? Yeah, if it gives what you need, but it is an interesting kind of thing. But the other side to that too is that you, I cross out more on this when I shouldn't have to, right? Because I can just make it go away and erase it. But I find that the, the actual, when I take notes, when I cross things out, that becomes a code in and of itself to me, where I can, I can read back where my thoughts were going on. And there's been some interesting work with deletions and mm -hmm, how yeah. our mistakes are in the digital age are erased. Mm -hmm. How authors who are only using word processors, like how are their archives going to look? Mm -hmm. Like what are we going to go back and look for? You can't see the deletion, or like in the case of like um, a medieval manuscript, you can't see you know that the scribe has tried to kind of scrape away mm -hmm. something. And those deletions become so important when you're creating editions and when you're you know when you're editing that it's going to be really interesting to see. If you didn't, today's writers, if they didn't keep versions, if you only have a final copy, where is the editor then? Like it really, there are some really interesting implications. Mm -hmm. That's if we could actually access something in 20 years that was written on a computer today, because let's face it, it will have changed so much that we won't be able to. So. With that horrible thought. <laughs> <laughs> well. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you, Dr. Walker.